Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives. Welcome to episode 45. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. You might remember Carrie Flanagan from episode 31 of this podcast. We had been talking about her new release, the Writer's Digest Guide to Magazine Article Writing, and we spoke a bit about that in that episode, and we also talked about Carrie's own writing career and the publishing imprint that she operates. But what we didn't talk about was the collaborative author venture she was involved in. Now, Carrie and her co-author Chuck Harrelson have been co-writing romance novels under the name C.K. Wiles. C.K. Wiles writes steamy romantic comedies. The first one came out in February 2018, and the third one is going to be out soon in November 2018. In the forthcoming interview, I chat with Carrie and Chuck, who are having a great time writing these novels together. They share the fantastic system that works really, really well for them, and that draws upon where they each bring strengths and qualities that complement one another, making for a really strong writing team. Um, Carrie and Chuck and I talk about co-writing, what works for them, and they give tips on what makes a good co-author experience. So if it's something that you're thinking of doing, you can definitely learn from the way that they work together. And before I get to that, I'm going to give a few personal updates. Uh, I'm getting ready to head back to Vegas um, this coming Monday, Monday, November 5th. Yes, I was just there for the WMG Masterclass, which I talked about a lot in in last episode, and I'm returning for 20 books to 50k, where yes, I'm going to jam my head full of more information, some great networking, etc. Even have plans uh, to get together again uh, with uh, Chris and Dean, who live in Vegas, uh, for a lunch, because it'll be a little bit less hectic uh, when they're not running the conference, so we can just sort of get caught up and chat. Um, In any case, I'll probably talk a little bit about that in the um, episode 46 in my personal notes. But in terms of personal updates for this week, today is November 1st when I'm recording this, and I'm a little bit conflicted because I decided not to do NaNoWriMo this year. Now, as much as I love NaNoWriMo, I had to make a really difficult decision and, and decide not to do it. And I decided instead to spend some concerted efforts this month working on a number of outstanding projects rather than starting another one that's just going to get put on the back burner. Now, two of my published novels, Evasion and A Canadian Werewolf in New York, were originally written as NaNoWriMo novels. Uh, Evasion was published within the you know the first six months or so of, of finishing it and I, at NaNoWriMo, because I actually finished the full novel. And A Canadian Werewolf in New York took me over 10 years to finish, so I don't want to repeat that again, because I have three other NaNoWriMo novels that I haven't finished. Let me take you back. So Coversion, which is the sequel to Evasion, uh, is sitting at about 52,000 words as an unfinished first draft. I probably have another 15 to 20,000 words to write for that one. Um, Fear and Longing in Los Angeles, which was last year's nano novel, um, and also the sequel to A Canadian Werewolf in New York, is sitting at about 55,000 words and needs to be about 85,000 words, and yet is another unfinished first draft. And Commune, a standalone horror novel, sits at about 56,000 words and yet again is only about 75% finished. It's yet one more unfinished novel. So I have three unfinished nano novels and I don't want to pull another 10 year process like I did for Canadian Werewolf in New York. So I need to get at least one of those darn things done this November. And that's my nano job for November 2018, or my nano task. I think I'm going to call it Nano Como, National Novel Completion Month. If I can take one of my previous nano 
Rymo novels and actually complete one of them in November 2018, I will consider that a nano success and still cheer on everyone else who's doing NaNoWriMo. If you are doing NaNoWriMo, let me know uh, by sending a, an email to me, mark at marklesley.ca, adding me at marklesley on Twitter, or commenting on the show notes at starkreflections.ca. Would love to be able to cheer you on in your nano efforts. And maybe you can cheer me on back in my nano completion <laughs> efforts for this month. On top of that, I have a uh, book project that I am doing as a sort of pro bono work. I'm putting together a biography for some people I've been working with. I have to get that done in November as well. On top of that, I have to make significant revisions um, to the book I had originally planned on releasing in November, the book, uh, nonfiction writing and publishing book called Indie Publishing Insider Secrets. And again, I had to make the difficult decision to push that off until February 2019. I really needed to give myself time for, uh, longer time for rewrites and a longer time to do back and forth with my editors. Um, the previous two books in that series I didn't give myself enough time, and that caused way too much stress, and I don't want to do that to myself. Because in the meantime, speaking of the other two books, I need to focus on getting the print versions of those previous two shorter books in the Stark Publishing Solutions series out. And that's, uh, I'm talking about the seven P's of publishing success and killing it on Kobo. Now, I also need to finish the audiobook versions for those two books. I have only recorded four of the ten segments for the seven P's of publishing success into audio, and I need to really get back on track with that. Then I can record the Killing It on Kobo book. Now, speaking of the audio, I did get a little bit back on track, and I've added the opening chapters that I've already recorded uh, for the seven P's of publishing success onto the Patreon page at patreon.com slash starkreflections. If you're a patron, you probably received notification about that. You see, I want my patron supporters to have full access to that audiobook before it's completed and before it's available for sale to the general public. And that's my way of saying thank you for your support. I'm hoping to move through a few more chapters in the next several weeks, and I'll continue to post them over there on Patreon. Then, once all my Patreon peeps have had a chance to access that audiobook uh, first, I'll be loading the audio files through my account at Findaway Voices, this episode's sponsor, where I can control the price and distribute the audiobook to the largest list of audiobook retailers and library systems in the world. And that includes Audible, Apple Audiobooks, or whatever they're calling what used to be called I iBooks, iTunes, audiobooks, whatever that was called. I really hope Apple gets into this game. <laughs> it looks like they are, but I'm really eager to see it happen. Um, also to Kobo Audiobooks, to Google Play, to Overdrive, to Biblioteca, and many, many, many more, including the new Authors Direct platform that Findaway Voices currently has in beta release that allows authors to sell their audiobooks directly. Now you can learn more about Findaway Voices at Stark Reflections dot ca find a way but back to uh, patreon users i'd like to thank this week's new patron mary joe rabe thanks for the support mary joe and welcome aboard you are joining such awesome folks as amy chuck ellie jamie joanna julie lee marcel maddie and per steiner what an awesome bunch of folks hi everyone thanks again and thanks mary joe this is neat you know i, I felt like i was just on um a locally syndicated version of the children's TV show Romper Room. Do you remember that show? It was this really unique show in that it was franchised and syndicated with tons of nationally and locally produced versions of the show created around the world. You see, I'd always thought it was a Canadian show because there were Canadian references in it when I was growing up. But I just recently learned that uh, Romper Room uh, the Canadian version of the Romper Room show that I had been watching in my own childhood in the early to late 1970s was produced right here in the Kitchener-Waterloo region where I live now at Kitchener's CKCO-TV. And that version ran nationally from 1972 to 1992 and was apparently the last version of the show in production anywhere. But do you remember that bit on Romper Room where they'd hold up the mirror and they would say everyone's names. And you're so excited if they said your name. <laughs> okay, 
I'm digressing. How's that for children's TV show trivia that I just shared? And heck, I didn't even get to talk about Polka Dot Door, which was a fully Canadian children's TV show that was kind of like Canada's version of Romper Room, uh, and, and which featured an odd kangaroo-like creature mascot called Pokeroo, who said only one, one word. That's right, Pokeroo. Did you hear that sound? Pokeroo, Pokeroo. It sounded like the Pokeroo. Pokeroo, 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 Pokeroo. It is the Pokeroo. How do you do, Pokeroo? How are you, Pokeroo? What do you say, Pokeroo, Pokeroo? Yes, Pokeroo, just like that. Okay, okay, I'm digressing into my childhood. Anyone who knows me knows that should be expected. But that's enough of personal updates. That's enough of my childhood television show memories. Let's get into the more adult interview with Carrie and Chuck. Just a quick note that this was recorded when I was in a Vegas hotel room and there was some weird audio interference on my feed, so you're going to hear a bit of noise on my side and I have to apologize for that in advance. Carrie, Chuck, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So I'm curious because last time we talked to Carrie, we were talking about your nonfiction stuff when we were talking about writing magazine (laughs) articles and you're doing this romantic steamy comedies now uh, with Chuck. So I I think I want to go back to the beginning. So how (laughs) I want to find out how you guys um, decided to do this, but how did you first meet? Oh, we've known each other for many years, but it was back in 2011 that Chuck reached out to me when he finished his first manuscript and wanted some help with developmental editing. So we worked together on that. And anything to add to that, Chuck? (laughs) But that's pretty much how we started working together. Yeah, actually, we've kind of, I guess if you think about it that way, we've kind of been bouncing back and forth ever since then, really. I mean, not true. Kind of, you know, not not officially, but (laughs) (laughs) we've bounced back and forth on manuscripts quite a bit over the last 10 years or so. Yeah, definitely. And just, I value Chuck's opinion on my writing and whether it's magazine articles or he was a huge help with the magazine writing book and not only with the writing part but helping hold me accountable to getting the chapters done when I <laughs> okay cool so when where, where did this spark of hey let's let's co-author the um uh, this <laughs> novel so how did that come about well <laughs> we <laughs> this hard with two people going here um <laughs> I had been writing or doing magazine articles on, you know, successful self-published authors and how to self-publish. And we were talking and just came up with this idea like, well, if we were to write something, what would we want to do? um, Anything else there? Chuck, just jump in. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Sorry. I didn't want to interrupt. Yeah. It was kind of, it kind of started off. It was a discussion of, you know, if we were going to write something together, what would be the, the, what would have the best chance of being successful? So we started going through kind of all the genres, YA, you know, fantasy, whatever, you know, and of course we hit on romance, which is the, of course, the biggest genre there is. And um, it was, it was really kind of a strategic decision mm-hmm. to, to try to hit on something that we would have the best chance of of doing well with and and so we started researching it and learning everything we could about it and and you know trying to learn how to do it better okay that's cool and and i had to ask and i i didn't ask this before the interview because i wanted to see if i was correct or not uh i was gonna ask where the pseudonym came from and i'm gonna i'm gonna speculate (laughs) that it's chris and carrie so ck wiles is chris carrie wiles is that Chuck, well, Chuck, Chuck. Or, or, yeah. sorry, Chuck. My apologies, uh, Chuck. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 C.K. Wiles is is Chuck Carey Wiles. Right. Right. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, that is. Uh, okay. So that's that's I, that was what I assumed when I saw it, and I thought. But any mm-hmm. anything else like Wiles? Is that because of the style of the book, or? Oh, we were looking up last names and trying to find something that had uh, fun meaning, and that one uh, 
when we looked it up, it's something about lure. And okay. so we just picked wiles and it had, it, uh, Rolled off. Had a ring to it. Yeah. It had a ring to it. That's what I was looking for. Had a ring to it. It had a ring to it. That's cool. It was quite a quite a wily uh, wily ring to it. Um, <laughs> so so I'm 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 curious to talk about the process about mm -hmm. how you did that. So you decided on it. You picked the name. The right. process was fascinating. Can you please tell us about it? <laughs> um, and sure. And Chuck, we can go back and forth on this because so I don't sure. want to just take over here. Um, but we start with brainstorming this storyline and we just came up with the storyline for the first one. We weren't looking at a big story arc. We knew we wanted to commit to three books because the research shows a single title isn't going to do well, series do well. So we brainstorm and then outline the whole book. Um, and then Chuck takes off and starts writing because he's a very, very fast fiction writer. Okay, I'm going to pause and go back because I want to know. So the brainstorm mm -hmm. sessions, you guys sure. both live in the same town? We we live about, what, an hour away from each other? Okay. Correct. So, so we're you, not you, you quite next door. Do you coffee shop? Do you do it via video chat? Like, what, how do you, how is the brainstorm? Is it email? Is it Skype? Uh, like, what, what what sort of method do you use for that? Well, the, actually, the first one we sat in a room together and kind of, it's kind of, I mean, it's kind of fun, really. We'll just sit there and we'll start from the very first page and think you know well we kind of have an idea what what we want the story to be and we'll start from the very like the first scene and what we why do, what do we want to happen and we'll literally with a pad and paper like talk through the entire book and jot down notes and flipping pages as fast as we can mm -hmm. you know going through the from beginning to end really okay. yeah that's that's really cool that's mm -hmm. that's really cool so you you're, you're working out do you call it the story beats or the outline or or yeah. what do you call that when you're doing that uh, yeah just our outline yep. a really really rough outline yeah <laughs> okay so you're satisfied with the story arc the characters the the main things that happen and then chuck you take it away and and you go to town on it like first yep. draft is that how that works yeah I'll, I'll i'll take the kind of the chicken scratch mess and kind of formalize it a little bit more and we'll usually bounce that back and forth a little bit and then yeah i'll take it and do a rough draft and then i'll send that to carrie and then she goes through and she's really good at um, editing and adding in like elements of emotion and 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 stuff like that which I, i'm not great at <laughs> which is great for for both of us because i'm really fast at writing rough drafts but she's great at seeing what needs to be added in in places where I missed it. Okay. All right, cool. So then you get the first draft, then Carrie mm -hmm. adds the stuff to it. Then what, what do you do with that at that point? What's the next step? Oh, and then it goes, usually I send that back to Chuck or we go back and forth if there's chapters that need to be reworked um, or there's some holes in there. So we go back and forth a little bit more. And when we feel good about about those then I send them all to Chuck and then he sends them through AutoCrit for extra editing. AutoCrit? So yeah so Chuck you want to explain what AutoCrit is? Yeah it's it's a uh, uh, it's just basically a software program it's it's pretty useful um, it's a it does all kinds of stuff but it's good at kind of um, spotting like uh, passive um, passive phrases and um, I don't know, just all, just repeated all words. Yeah. Repeated words, all kinds of little things that it's, it's just editing software. I mean, it's not foolproof by any means, but it's helpful in, in as a tool to help me find stuff, I guess would be the best mm -hmm. way to explain it. But it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's good to use when you get to that point where you think it's finished, but it's really not. <laughs> and then you run it through at that point and it's, and it, it's really helpful to get it to that very, very finished stage. Okay. And now, and so I, cause I'm not familiar with this is AutoCrit. Is it a website you just upload to, or is it a piece of software you install on your computer? How does that? No, it's web based. Yeah. Um, it's, I think it, you had to subscribe to it, okay. but it's all web based. Yeah. You upload, you know, your, I do one chapter at a time, but I don't know if there's a limit to it, but okay. 
is it, I mean, similar to Grammarly? Is it that sort of thing mm -hmm. where it checks yeah. you know, yeah. potential typos, same. And maybe passive voice and, yes. and things that you may, may need to be careful about? Okay. Yeah, same sort of thing. Um, I'll have to check that out and include a link to that in uh, the show mm -hmm. notes. Um, I'm going to go back to the process. You decided to do three books. Did you did you did you beat them all together? Like beat them all out together and write them all together? And then what's your release strategy for that? No, um, no, we did not write them all together. So we did the first one, okay, and then talked through the second one. And then as we got to know our characters, it kind of helped. That helped us decide where the direction was going. So after first the first one was done and was complete, then then you had a bit more of what what might happen next with these characters. Mm -hmm. okay. Correct. Right. Right. Does this mean that when you first sat down, did you envision a three book story arc, or was it just we're going to have the story and, and we have an idea of what may happen? We just know there's going to be two more books. <laughs> like how? how uh, um, just what you said. We kind of we knew this first one, but then <laughs> okay, we were just kind of winging it for the uh, okay. So it wasn't like a George Lucas it. thing where you had this thing. Oh, God, out. No. No, I'm going to tell this story <laughs> now, but I kind of have this thing in mind. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, we've actually it, it's kind of uh, emerged into. It always feels like it would be a like a TV series. So we've created all these characters, okay. and the location stays the same, but the points of view in the different books change but we're creating this whole quirky cast of characters and it all takes place in this old bohemian theater historic theater so they're almost because they are shorter uh books so they each one feels like a different episode to me and uh it's interesting that you talk about it that way because so much of um media is now being consumed in that binge watching on mm -hmm. you know, Netflix series and stuff right, like that. Right, right. Uh, is this, is this an experiment where you're going to see how the first three books do? And then, and then if the people demand, you're just going to have the characters <laughs> have more adventures and, and, and it gets renewed mm -hmm. for a new season. Is that, is it going to be that Correct. kind of thing? Okay. Yes, it is. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, That's exactly. We're, we're, you know, once this third book's going to be released in November, not sure when this is running, but, and then some heavy marketing, to then get some traction for these first three. So you've released the first two, but you're not going to do any real marketing until the third one. Is that how I right? Right. But we did a little bit for the first two, but the, okay. the heavy marketing is going to hit with number three. Okay. And so when did the first book and the second book come out? What was the schedule? Oh gosh, February was the first one. Okay. I think the second one was June. Okay. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and then this one will be mid-November. Okay. So you spaced it out by mm -hmm. a number of months and, and you've got yeah. that. Okay. And then I, I, I love getting into the weeds because it's all the, the, the cause I love metadata and stuff like that. <laughs> did you plan out um, like for the cover? Uh, did you plan out a, a look and feel based on, so steamy uh, romantic comedy. Did you, did you, you did some research into that. This is what these books would look like. Cause it is, it's kind of a Venn diagram of, of, of different <laughs> of different genres right uh, how, I mean how how new is that to you guys that specific genre and how much research did you have to do to to get the voice and to get the, the look hmm. um, we and it, once again it was all back to that first book so we right okay we, we, yeah <laughs> so it was based on the first book so once we came up with a cover we were uh, happy with for the first one then the other two we wanted to complement the first one so that if you look at all three of them that it's clear that they're together okay uh, in the series yeah, they've, they've really evolved like the mm -hmm. first one I, we didn't i was going to say struggled but we didn't we didn't struggle with it um we learned a mm -hmm. lot as we wrote that book and even uh, as you're saying like the story arc where we wrote the first one and we had the story as we went now that we've gotten the third one we've seen like there's a, there's a really large story arc kind of revealing itself that can really go a long ways in these books. But that was never really planned for in the beginning, you know. If it gets renewed for another season. Right, right. exactly, exactly. Yeah. You don't want to leave it with a cliffhanger. <laughs> <laughs> like the right, right, right. Firefly. Uh, oh, right. <laughs> um, did, so I'm also curious about, the, does that mean that because you, you're waiting to do the heavy marketing until book three is, is live, so that, that means book three isn't up for pre-order yet or what is oh, it is it yeah. has been for how long um i'm trying to think what today oh. is it less than a week okay 
So it's up for pre-order. It's going to be mm -hmm. uh, coming out uh, next month. We're recording this towards the end of October, mm -hmm. uh, 2018. And, uh, and, and then does that mean that in the metadata, did you actually enter series information or did you just like, because I assume each book is standalone and can be read and enjoyed on its own. Correct. Well. Yeah, so each one. Did you include I, the series metadata like volume for, uh, one correct. and two? You did? Yes, I okay. did. Okay. Um, and then I guess the other thing I'm thinking of is uh, I do love the weeds and I love the, the details is. <laughs> Uh, where where have you published it and and what process did you use because there's two of you and you're trying to mm -hmm. collaborate on this one person has an account or did you create a, a new account for both of you like oh. how, how did that work I, yeah we created a new account so everything's under the ck wiles pen name okay. just so that i could track it and because i have with my small publishing company hot chocolate press i have gosh, 18 books through that, but I wanted this to be separate so that we could look at the data and look at what's working and what's not. Okay. And we decided to go wide okay. with these. So you're not exclusive uh, to Amazon, you're publishing? Correct. Uh, so with Kobo, with draft to digital um, okay. and with KD KDP. KDP. Mm -hmm. So you're going, and, and again, I love the weeds. You're going direct to <laughs> KDP. You're going direct to Kobo writing life, uh, to Kobo through Kobo writing life. You use right. draft to digital for I, for the rest of them, um, the yeah, I always go direct with Kobo and KDP, okay. and then so I use Draft to Digital, uh, right? Tolino and, uh, mm -hmm. and all the subscription ones. Okay, cool. And so you basically you're managing three different accounts to get your book in, in wide, uh, wide as possible distribution. Correct. And then. I guess it's, I'm assuming it's a 50, 50 split. I don't want to get into the, the specifics of it, but yes. I'm assuming this oh, yeah. is a partnership. So yeah. uh, we, we, we have our expenses and we split them and then we have a, a whatever. Um, okay. Did you, and again, uh, because I, I find this is really valuable for those who are looking at collaborating. Did you create a joint bank account for it? Or is it, you know, Carrie's got the, the account set up and she's going to just PayPal over or transfer money over to Chuck <laughs> or how does that work? Uh, that, oh, go ahead, Carrie. <laughs> that, what you just, the second thing you said. So it's okay. I created the accounts, and then I take care of that. And okay, we because uh, that's the thing that fascinates me. As I, I believe the future of publishing is, is mm -hmm. collaboration, and 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 I, I I'm very interested in tools that allow collaboration to, to be easier for authors. Right. right. Now we talked about should we create a you know a joint bank account and all yeah. of that, and decided that I would just take care of that part of it. Right, right. And did you come up, I know you've known each other for a long time, but did you come up with a core basic, because Carrie, you're a publisher as well, and you work with mm -hmm. authors, did you have a, 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 an agreement, like a, a yes. some sort of contract? To, to we did actually, yeah. yeah, create a contract just to spell it out. And okay, yeah, um, I think that's important. Yeah, because Chuck could be uh, Chuck could be in in Hollywood, you know, on on vacation, and, and a producer, you know, offers to to buy the rights to these characters. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, exactly. the, the things can happen, right? And and there has right. to be an sure. agreement that we decide these things together. Or, Absolutely. Okay. Uh -huh. did, yeah. You know, so, how did, did you did that based on some of the stuff you've done as a publisher already, or did you have to find other resources to help you with that, like a template? Um, I used pretty much the one I've used for my other authors. Um, we had to do some tweaking of that with the co-author agreement, but right. I, okay. I already had a basic contract. Oh, that's cool. Okay, so and mm -hmm. that's the ebook, and we've got the, the the partnership, and we've got the logistics mm -hmm. of the ebook, and, then, and I assume there's a print book. Correct. Uh, as well, available. Yep. Why and not? How is, and how is that uh, using Ingram Spark, or how are you, like how are you doing the print? Uh, um, I'm doing KDP. KDP print. Now, yeah, but okay. using Vellum to okay to um, format, format. Oh, oh, for sure. i yeah. love vellum okay. the best program have you because you've been doing a, a print and print on demand for a while have you how have you overcome some of the challenges i've heard from kd <laughs> for print not being quite as up to par as create space was oh i'm just day by day you just yeah, go okay. in and <laughs> just deal with the changes and, um, yeah just go with it Okay. What day am I going to do? I mean, day yeah. by day in a bottle of wine, right? That's yes, exactly. Okay. Big um, bottle. <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, w is there anything you're excited to share with other writers about this process and something that you maybe weren't expecting when you first started and had the brainchild say, Hey, let's do this. And it's like something happened. I didn't expect this to happen. Chuck, do you got any? Hmm. This kind of goes back to what we were talking 
about even before this phone call, Chuck, and why this works for us and how others can, like, what they can look for if they're trying to do a co-author do experience. Thing, yeah. So I'm going to let you, because I've been doing all the talking <laughs> on the publishing part. Yeah, I would say, I mean, I don't know if it was unexpected necessarily, but right. um, I would say it's, I, we were kind of, we were kind of talking about that a little bit because we hadn't really talked about it before. Like what makes this work between the two of us? And it's, it's, a lot of it is having no ego on a, you know, a collaborative work. Like everything that we work on together is it's ours, you know, it doesn't matter who wrote it or who wrote what, you know, that's not to say that we don't have any disagreements on anything. We kind of have a little chuckle over, you know, we'll change, we'll, we'll bounce a manuscript back and forth and change one word back and forth 10 times before we, you know, <laughs> actually get on a phone and, you know, roll our eyes at each other. But <laughs> uh, it's, it's having that, just not having an ego about it and trusting each other and knowing that it's, you know, it's, it's something that we're both doing together. Just, it just works mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to be something that uh, we are. I mean, our writing styles are drastically different. If we were to write something, you know, two different things, it, it would look nothing alike, but somehow when we <laughs> get together, it, it, it just it works. Or the two strengths between the two of us works. Yeah. Like I said, you know, I'm, I'm good at writing rough drafts and real fast. And she's really, mm -hmm. Carrie's really good at, you know, going through and putting emotion and feeling and, and, and seeing where things are missing and plugging in things here and there. And she's so good at doing that kind of stuff and where I'm not, you know, mm -hmm. so you put those two things together and it, and it comes up with this, this really fabulous finished work in mm -hmm. half the time that it would take, you know, one person to do it. Right. Okay. And then Chuck with the humor, my God, you, it makes me laugh every time. Just all the humor that he puts in there <laughs> is wonderful. Okay. And it inspires me every now and then to throw a couple good lines in there. But <laughs> <laughs> so what, what, in, what through this experience have you guys learned about what makes a really good uh, collaborative author experience? It goes back to that trusting each other and knowing that it is a collective work and um okay so that is yeah. a fundamental uh, it really is to have. Okay. yeah it really is and playing on our strengths um if we if we were to relying on me to crank out a first draft we wouldn't even have book one done okay so um, <laughs> it's just looking at those strengths and playing to those and yeah and knowing that like mm -hmm. i wouldn't i mean i'm, I'm not saying i don't tr try to like I keep going back to the emotional part, but <laughs> I, I'm not saying I don't try to infuse emotion into my writing, but you know, I know that that's not my strength, but I know that that's Carrie's strength. So, you know, and she knows writing a rough draft is my strength. So mm -hmm. we're not going to switch on the next book and say, well, Carrie's going to write the rough draft and I'm going to infuse all the emotion. That's, <laughs> you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we, we know, we know it works. So we stick work. to that and, you know, and, and, and it's just become, it, with every book, it's becoming more and more streamlined. It really is. And we're learning so much every time and what, okay. what to do first and what to do second. And, and it's just better each time. And then, and then the idea, I, thinking back to the first one and um, knowing that there's another person. So even when Chuck was writing the rough draft and they go, oh, it's not quite ready yet. And I'm like, well, that's what I'm here for. Send it to me. So getting to to that point where like, oh yeah, there's two of us. So right. we don't have to carry that burden yeah. individually. It's so much better to wander mm. around in a desert with two people instead of <laughs> by yourself. <laughs> yes. That's cool. Yeah. You guys mentioned ego before. You have to kind of check your ego and uh, the trust mm -hmm. thing. What about the fact that you both are writers who've done other things and have a brand? Now mm -hmm. you're creating a completely new one, but it's not even you know, your names aren't on the cover. Does that, does that affect the process in any way? Not really. No. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, we've even kind of, uh, uh, and I guess stop me, Carrie, if you want to stop me, but. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we, we've even kind of uh, 
discussed uh, strategically moving forward with our writing careers as um, as far as branding goes, um, expanding on her platform as a nonfiction writer and my platform as a like YA fantasy uh, and adult fantasy writer and using her name as um, the platform for nonfiction and my name for the platform for fantasy and sticking with a pen name for the romance and writing up to three books a year and together. Yeah. And, and Doing still, all together. And still collaborating on all three. Yeah. Oh, well, that's mm-hmm. fascinating. So it's, it's, it's a collaboration that's worked so well for you guys yes. that you're willing to, to split it off into three different uh, mm-hmm. brands of collaboration. That is, I love that. That is great. Yeah, absolutely. So that, that suggests to me that this has been a huge success. It's doing okay then. <laughs> right. Well, sales wise, we're still waiting for that to yeah. get some Once book three into- hits yeah. and you do the marketing. So what do you have planned for promotions? Like what do you, what, because you're not, you're, it's a new brand. It's not Carrie's mm-hmm. existing one or it's not right. John's existing one. Right. So we have CK Wiles and we've kind of created our own little persona for her. Now that now our secret's out that it's two of us and not <laughs> one person. Um, so looking at, I definitely want to box up all three for an ebook. Um, running promotions through Kobo and try to think of what else, looking at newsletters, just trying to get a lot of attention to it when it first comes out. Okay. And looking at, uh, for people who sign up for our newsletter at CK Wiles, we will give them the first book for free. And you're going to tell us what, what website they can go to to sign up for that, right? Yes, ckwiles.com. Oh, easy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so if they go there, they'll get the first one for free. So we will be doing a lot of that as well, getting that first one into the hands of people. And hopefully they love the characters we've created and the, um, yeah, and the comedy. And Excellent. That is fantastic. Yeah, um, this is and podcasts this. too. We're doing podcasts oh, to you, help. You're doing a podcast, the CK Wiles. <laughs> no, sorry, no, it's just being oh, on your oh, podcast. Oh, I was, was going to say CK Wiles is going to do a podcast. <laughs> that would be. No, we have not talked about that. <laughs> Hi, I'm C. Hi, I'm K. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, that's cool. Well, I'm glad to have you guys on this podcast because it's it's fascinating to see the different kinds of collaborations, and I'm really intrigued by how well it's working for the one mm-hmm. brand that you made up to go back to existing brands and see if you can grow it even more by, by that. Cause, because you can do more when you, when you work together, I think. Which is and there's something right, right. like Chuck said, instead of one person walking out in the desert alone, it's two of us. Um, so there's a sense of uh, comfort when you're sending things out because the two of us have seen it, been through it. And right. so you have that confidence to send it out. Cause sometimes when you're working on everything by yourself, you're like, Oh, is this good enough? And, I'm not sure. Right. Okay. That's cool. So that really helps. Okay, cool. So for listeners to find out more, we know we can mm-hmm. go to ckwiles.com to find out Correct. more about the series with mm-hmm. links to the book on all the platforms yes. uh, available in print and uh, in ebook. Um, mm-hmm. Where can uh, listeners find out more about you guys and the other titles and your own author brands? <laughs> uh, for me, that would be, carryflanagan.com or even hotchocolatepress.com. Okay. And then for, well, for me, I don't, I, my <laughs> titles haven't been uh, published yet. So. Oh, okay. All right. Cool. Yeah, yeah. All right. So what we're going to check out CK Wiles to see your published titles. Yes. Right. 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 Excellent. Cool. Well, thank you guys so much for uh, spending the time with me today. Well, thanks for having us. Thank you. I wanted to reflect on something that Carrie and Chuck talk about that is an important element of their collaboration. Playing off of one another's strengths. That's one of the benefits of a partnership or a collaborative process. Two or more people playing off each other's strengths. Now doing this properly together, the two of them can produce far more than the sum of just two people. Because the strengths that each of them leverages works up to more than the sum of its parts. That's a fantastic collaboration. Now I have often criticized the indie author community for sometimes operating like a bunch of eight-year-olds playing soccer. And anyone who's watched a group of young children playing soccer know what I'm talking about. Nobody plays their position. All the kids just blindly follow after the ball in a big mass of people. 
as it meanders back and forth or side to side across the field. There's no strategy, there's no positions, there's no teamwork, just a mob driving after the ball, moving about in space, seemingly randomly if you didn't actually see where the ball was. A bad collaboration is like that. You see, you could have some great individual players in that mob, but not understanding how to work together or enhance one another brings no value to that mess. But a solid collaboration, like a team that recognizes the individual strengths, that's where it's at. Speaking of sports, now growing up in mid-northern Ontario, hockey was an important and central part of my childhood. It's in my blood. I played it from almost since I could first stand up on skates. Now, I did drop out um, by the time I was in grade 8, but that was mostly due to politics, not due to the game. I loved the game of hockey, and I loved the position that I played in hockey. I played defense, and I loved defense. You see, I lived with the goal of protecting my team's goalie, of protecting our end of getting the puck out of our end and back into the opposition end. I could skate faster backwards than half the other players could skate forwards. And I used that to my advantage when playing the defensive position. I could very quickly and deftly move and maneuver. And I learned how to take control of the puck. But here's something I was never good at. I never leveraged that taking control of the puck towards breakaways and goals because I wasn't good at that. Whenever I took control of the puck, I never focused on scoring or shooting on the net. Again, that was not my strength. My strength was to retake control of the puck and then to get it as quickly as possible to an offensive player on my team. So whenever I got the puck, I always knew where one of the three forward position players on my team were, and I immediately passed it to one of them. Their strength, usually, was breaking forward into the opposing end and shooting on the net. Now one of my teammates, as an example, who happened to be a fellow defenseman, now he was a killer slap shot from, from the blue line. And he was, of course, the exception. So if we were both at the blue line in the opposing team's end, and I got the puck, rather than dump it right back into one of the forwards, if I had the opportunity, I would slide the puck across to him, and he would deliver a killer slap shot at the net, often getting it in. Again, recognizing the different players on the team, where they are and what their strengths were. The important thing there is knowing who those other players were, knowing the details of their strengths, and knowing your own strengths, but also being mindful of your own weaknesses. Like my own inability to score on the net, for example. <laughs> and making sure that you're playing to those strengths and playing to those weaknesses. Now, we had to move lightning fast in hockey, and we had to trust that each player was playing to their strengths and was in their expected positions at all times. We even had to sense where they were, even without being able to see it. We trusted and we counted on one another. And that's what Carrie and Chuck do. Carrie admits that if she were in charge of the first draft, the first book still wouldn't have been written. And they're on book three right now. <laughs> And it's taking ownership like that for one's own strengths and one's own areas of weaknesses, and it's playing to them that works. In writing collaborations, perhaps it's identifying someone who, who's better at drafting the first beat, so someone who masters quick first drafts, someone who flushes out the emotional resonance, someone who inserts the important spice of humor, someone who takes on the role of project managing a task, someone who is good at handling the finances, somebody who's better at tech, someone who understands EPUBs and HTML. Of course, you can find this type of collaboration even if you aren't co-writing or co-publishing with someone else. Perhaps the collaboration is with your editor or with your cover designer or with somebody else you rely on for areas you know you aren't as good at. Find the person, respect their skill, and play to their strengths, and trust that they will play to their own strengths too. Trust, teamwork, playing to the strengths of the people on your team. Pause for a moment and take a look at your own team. 
regardless of whether or not you write independently or for a publisher, there's still likely some sort of element of team there for you to play upon. I mean, even if you're just completely independent and doing every single thing yourself, when you publish to KDP, to Kobo Writing Life, or use Draft to Digital, you expect that the handoff from your end to their end goes well, and they'll take it from there. You expect that the servers are going to be up and running, that the retail sites will actually be alive. Yeah, perhaps you're depending on the conversion, the free conversion tool that's built in there. Perhaps it's the selling of uh, the, the retail at the price that you set. Perhaps it's distributing the price and the metadata to all the other retail sites. You expect that when sales happen, that the money earned will be paid back to you. There's an inherent trust and a sense of teamwork, regardless of your role in actually collaborating with other writers or not. There's probably some elements of trust, teamwork, and playing to strengths. So play to your strengths. Understand those you partner with, what their strengths are, and how you rely on those strengths that they provide. And go play and go win. Well, that's it for this episode of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is Mark Leslie Lefebvre. Thanks so much for hanging out with me again in episode 45. I hope you enjoyed this. If you did enjoy it, please feel free to share it with a friend or someone that you think would benefit from the podcast. Thanks for hanging out with me again. I will catch you next week in episode 46. And until then, here's wishing you great writing, great strikes and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomtech.com.